Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday morning message. I hope this finds all of you doing well. Beautiful time of the year, spring, grass is green, flowers are blooming, and thank the Lord for all of his goodness and mercy to us, and thank you for being with us this morning. We really do appreciate you, and I hope you're doing well. As I read the Bible and try to dig deeper into its truths, uh, the fact that God has used, is using, and will use people and things of any form fashion, personality, or anything else to bring about his perfect will that never ceases to amaze me. It's absolutely awesome to read how that down through history, God has used men and women and young people alike and any other thing he decided upon to bring his will, his plan of reconciling lost mankind back to himself. Think about it. In Genesis, God used a flood to destroy the earth because man had become so wicked that the Bible tells us it repented God that he had ever even made us. But a man named Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and God used him, used his wife, used his three sons and their wives to carry on the human race. Later on, God would use a man named Abraham and promise that through his offspring, the entire world would be blessed in that as we know now, the son of the living God, Jesus Christ, the savior of, your, of the world, would come through Abraham's family. And yes, think about this. Abraham's wife, Sarah, uh, had the child that began this family. God had promised them when she was 90 years old. His name was Isaac, of course. And even though Sarah had laughed at the idea of having a child when she was so old, it still happened because God in all of his wisdom, providence, and power, will use anyone or anything to bring about his perfect will. And certainly, a miracle is nothing to God, is it? Now, I want to pause here for just a moment. Why did God choose these men and their families to be such a huge part uh, of, his, of uh, his will being accomplished? Have you ever thought about that? Why would he use people like Abraham? Why would he use people like Noah? Was it because they were some super spiritual people? Well, on the contrary. They were sinners just like everyone else from Adam until the people in 2024 are. Noah, if you recall, got drunk and brought shame and judgment to his family. Abraham lied about Sarah and did not wait on the Lord's uh, promise of a son with Sarah and wound up with Sarah's handmaid and had a son named Ishmael in which the world has had trouble ever since. And don't forget Moses, the man God used to, to bring his people out of, out of Egypt, was a murderer. And on down through history, as we read in Scripture, David, the greatest king in Israel, became an adulterer and a murderer with his sin with Bathsheba. Solomon, his son, whom God had given more wisdom than anyone in the world, had ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. Wow. So why did God use and choose these sinful people? Well, that's all he had. That's why. Because every member of mankind are sinners. But the most important reason for these people ending up as famous people in the scripture is because they were people of faith, even though they had their issues. They believed God and took him at his word. They knew they were sinners and God was holy, but God was also a God of forgiveness and great mercy. In Hebrews eleven seven, as we talk about this thing of faith for a moment, we see clearly that by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Hebrews 11, 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And then on down in verse 17 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. But we know the rest of the story. God intervened, didn't he? 
in Hebrews 11, 24 through 29, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them, should touch Israel as well. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, we find this reference to King David. And when he had removed him, when God had removed Saul, he raised up unto him David to be their king, to whom also gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So, we see that God uses people, people from all walks of life, to accomplish his perfect will. Obviously, we don't understand God's thinking or his ways many times in our lives. Both are much higher than ours. Neither did these we just mentioned, but they had faith in God, and we must as well. We just have to trust him in what he does, don't we? What other choice do we have? We have no other. And furthermore, we cannot please God without trusting him, without faith. It's impossible. In the book of Ruth, if you recall, we know that God used not a king or a queen, but common people. Ruth was dirt poor, but Boaz, of course, was a wealthy farmer, and he accepted the role of the kinsman redeemer for Ruth and took the love of his life for his wife. If you recall, Boaz and Ruth had a son who was named Obed, who would grow up and have a son named Jesse, who would grow up and have a son named David, who would be the greatest king in Israel. Boaz and Ruth, you see, were King David's great-grandparents. God used people again in a very unusual way to keep the lineage leading to the cross of Jesus Christ, our Savior, alive. Now, there is another story concerning this lineage, this line of people, this family of the children of Israel. And in our time remaining with you this morning, I want to give you another example that God sometimes uses the most unusual circumstances and chooses the most unlikely people to accomplish his divine purposes. Let's look back in Joshua for a few moments. Joshua chapter 2. And I'm going to read several verses here. The, the, the scripture tells the story best. I can't add anything to it. But in Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, we find these words. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out to Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I was not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, and ye shall overtake them. So, what had Rahab done? Well, she had hid the two spies of the children of Israel. In a moment, we'll see why. And when she was asked about them, she didn't exactly tell the truth, did she? She hid them. She told them to go look for them. She didn't know where they were going, so she encouraged 
the people of the town there to go and try to find them. And look at what she did in verse 6. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up and up to them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know, here it is now, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Now listen to what Rahab says. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. You see, this is a woman which had a sin problem. This is a woman with a bad reputation. But this is a woman who has faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because she has seen his mighty and terrible acts on behalf of his people Israel. And I'll prove she had faith in Hebrews 11:31. back to our focal chapter. By faith, it says, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now let's pick back up in Joshua 2:12 for a moment. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness that ye will show also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. What token could she be talking about? What is this token or why is this token so important? Oh dear friends, listen to me. In Exodus chapter 12, 13, we find the token. And the blood shall be for you a what? A token upon the houses which ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You see, the plague of killing of the firstborn, the tenth plague, was about to take place. Dear Christian brother and sister, you and I have a token today as well, and it's been applied to our sinful souls. Our token is the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. When God's judgment and wrath are poured out on sin, we have no worries because the blood is applied. Back to Joshua a moment there in chapter 2, verse 13. And that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. You see, she knew that the Israelites were coming. They knew already what they'd done in, other two, in the other two lands. They destroyed them utterly, and they knew they were coming to take the land. And verse 14 says, And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be, when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may ye go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. 
And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood is upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us swear. And she said, According to your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. You see, get this. This is so wonderfully illustrated about the love of God for lost mankind. It's the story of the same love that he has for us. You see, the scarlet line that the men told her to put in the window was Rahab's token she had asked for so that when the children of Israel invaded and destroyed Jericho, she and her family would be spared. When the spies returned to Joshua with their report on Jericho, and they began to plan their attack by the word of the Lord, they told Joshua about the kindness of Rahab. They told them how she hid them and that they had promised her if she would, would hang a scarlet cord from her window, she and her family would be saved. In Joshua 6, chapter 20 and 25, let's look at what happens. So the people shouted, the war, the battle starting to take place. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. They took Jericho and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Now, you may ask, in hearing all of this scripture, Preacher, why did we need to go through that? Well, if you hadn't got it by now, maybe you will in a minute. You see this perfect picture of Jesus. My, my. And his salvation for us. Why is this story so significant? Well... There are many reasons it's significant, but I want to leave you with two as we close. Number one is that Rahab was not Jewish. She was a Canaanite, as we know, who would marry an Israelite named Salmon from the tribe of Judah. Who came through the tribe of Judah? Jesus, the Messiah. Salmon and Rahab would have a son whose name was, you know it, Boaz, who took Ruth, a Moabite, as his wife. And they had Obed. And Obed had Jesse, and Jesse had David. Joseph, the legal father of Jesus, the earthly father of Jesus, was the harlot's Rahab, direct descendant. The remarkable thing I want you to get about this story 
about this is how God kept his covenant with Abraham in promising all the people of the earth would be blessed through his seed. His lineage for ultimately Jesus would be born as Joseph's legal son. Certainly Jesus was not Joseph's son in the flesh, but he was his legal earthly father. Jesus, of course, was conceived by the Holy Spirit when he came upon Mary. That's the number one thing. God protected the lineage of Abraham so God's plan of salvation through Jesus could take place. And know this today. He'll continue to protect them because their Messiah is coming. Secondly, the story is so important for us to understand because it proves that God can and will use anyone to establish his divine purposes, number one being the salvation of lost mankind. As we've seen in this message this morning, God uses the powerful. God uses the weak and needy to carry on his work on earth. But we all have one thing in common, and that is that we're all sinners in some way or another, and God knows that. That's why we all need a scarlet rope. Our scarlet rope began at a cross. It came flowing down from the brow, the hands and the feet and the side of one who offered himself as a payment for my sins and your sins as well as those in the world. The blood of Christ, the Lamb, is our scarlet rope. And when God sees that blood applied to our sins, they are forgiven and we stand righteous before our Heavenly Father, not having to worry about the judgment and destruction that will come to those without Christ. You see, Rahab's scarlet rope saved her from the wrath of Joshua and his army. It's a perfect picture of Jesus and his scarlet red blood being shed on the cross for lost mankind. God uses people. A little over three years ago, I attended a funeral of the mother of a couple of my friends I've known since I was six years old. Both of them are preachers now. And they asked me to close the service in prayer. I was very honored. The next day I received a text from the younger brother. It said this. Thanks for coming yesterday and closing in prayer. That was a blessing. I'm amazed at what God has and will use. A fish for Jonah. A rooster for Peter. And a donkey for Jesus to ride on. And three old rednecks <laughs> talking about me and him and his brother from King's Creek School to preach the gospel. God uses people, always allowing to use you. You never know what he may do. God bless you today and thank you for being with us. Until we speak again.